Instructional Designers and in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the cloud-based authoring tool for e-learning. Learn how your team can work together better at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. You're much better at chair dancing than me. In fact, I've you, you've got the facial expression. It's years of practice, that's all it is. Good morning, folks. Ooh, Cornhusker State. That must be Iowa? Uh, I'm at a loss because um, uh, I'm Canadian, so I don't know some of these locales. I think so, right? <laughs> by, by right, nickname, Kim? So. <laughs> Kim W. is Cornhusker, Iowa. Grand. Oh, holy cow. Hey, gang, guess what? Brent's on vacation this week. I'm not even sure where he's on vacation. It's top secret. Actually, Brent's a spy. You guys didn't know that, but now you do. Oops, <laughs> that's out of the bag. Nebraska, and... sorry. <laughs> uh, there we go. Ah, well, now that we've got the daily dancing out, or the weekly dancing, I guess, out of the way for the day, um, I'm seeing some really cool uh, weather chats, uh, etc. cetera, in... Uh, and including Trevor, who's noting that his tortoises might actually uh, be going into hibernation over there in the UK. Folks, our guest uh, this week is Rachel Dillon. And Rachel was also mentioning that she has tortoises. I do. I have desert tortoises. And again, mm -hmm. mine are almost ready to uh, start hibernating as well. That, oh, I, uh, so a desert tortoise, um, what, would the, what would its natural locale actually be if it wasn't you know, a pet and it had arrived in the wild? They actually are are like Mojave Desert. Um, oh, okay. They're you know deserts in New Mexico and lower parts of California and uh, Arizona. So they are a threatened species. Oh. Um, so yeah, so actually I adopted them um, and have raised them. So nice. they live a hundred years. Wow. So you have to have a succession plan in place then, I guess. Absolutely. And my son has said no. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter you know who's training to be she's pre-veterinarian uh in college she's like i'll take them okay <laughs> so. well it, it feel, feels like a good fit then too so yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly yeah um rachel you have been with us um about a year or so ago once but uh besides the tortoises tell yes. the folks uh, that are joining us here today just a little bit about yourself and a bit of a background in case they didn't catch that episode before Okay. Yeah, I'm super excited to be here. I love to talk about what I'm, what I'm going to talk about today. Um, my background is uh, graphic design. So I started out, uh, you know, in college as, as graphic designer. I've always had art in my in my kind of back pocket. And I have then kind of morphed into instructional design in the last about seven or eight years. Um, I ended up learning, well, what the heck is instructional design? <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I was like, what, do, what is this? You know, and then when I saw that it is tying together my love of teaching, my love of learning, and my love of visual and graphic design, I was like, whoa, you know, sign me up. <laughs> so I went to the, um, just went on an online program with the uh, University of um, California Irvine's extension program and got myself an e-learning certificate and just fell in love with everything, got myself a job as an instructional designer. And then I actually was one of those people who said, you know what, I loved that experience of learning so much. I went back to um, get a master's degree in instructional design and technology um, through uh, California State University Fullerton. And I Perfect. just graduated in May. So Ooh, I was one of those get your master's during the pandemic. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, you know, and now I am a uh, manager of learning and development, um, utilizing my graphic design, using my visual design and um, and all of that in, in helping to make um, a better learning experience in the corporate field. So very cool. yeah. yeah. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, that 
that better learning experience uh, stuff today yeah. we're going to focus on you know there, you, you referred to morphing into instructional design and so much so many of us folks in this space come from somewhere else um, accidentally uh, discover this world you know fall in yeah. love with it but we all come from some so many different backgrounds. Um, I'm a words guy. I have a, an English degree, you know, was a journalist before this. So for me, one of the funnest parts, I guess, um, of, of, of working in this space has been learning to think more visually. Uh, I'm not someone who grew up, you know, feeling comfortable or, or confident in, in drawing and doodling. I, you know, that wasn't something, um, you know, my, my forte. But as we, you know, as I've spent more and more time in this space, really tried to understand how we can present information you know better visually etc so it's um it's it's kind of like a sidebar you know uh fascination for, for me from that prof professional perspective as well but so many of us do come in without a, a solid background in visual design um and then even with even if you do have a good visual design there's still a lot of other things to know about you know just even the how the brain works and in, in processing images we might make something that's quite beautiful but it might not actually work so great for you know for for learning are helping other people learn from it either so yeah yeah you know you you hit on a really uh, kind of one of those little parts that you know rubs me a little bit and and i see carrie or kari um I, I love that there's that connection um you're just like you're trying to learn more about instructional design and, and you, it's amazing that they're kind of in that same family but I'll, i get rubbed really wrong when someone's just like oh i'm gonna just hand this to you and could you just make it pretty <laughs> and i'm like <laughs> Yeah, sure. I'll make it pretty for you. But you do know a lot goes into that prettiness. So, you know, so um, it's a it's an interesting world to come from this visual place and the visual graphic design side and to really see kind of the, these different levels, um, you know, with with how it's introduced to instructional designers. Um, if you don't come into the field or if you, you know, that that you don't have that background. Um, you know, I, I see people struggling, the new instructional designers that I work with, they, they struggle and they, they're just like, oh, I'm not an artist. And I'm just like, whoa, you know, you don't have to be an artist. You don't have to be a graphic designer. But there is this fundamental that that um, mm -hmm. I think if, if people continue and, and we'll talk about that um, to focus on, you know, what how am I seeing this and what am I seeing and what my brain's doing when these visuals um, are presented in front of me, that it kind of gives us a little bit more direction of what to do, because I think sometimes we freeze up. We just think, um, I'm just going to go with a template. You know, <laughs> I'm not quite sure what I'm supposed to be doing with this. So. Um, so yeah, so I love the idea, you know, my thesis is actually, um, was on visual design and cognitive load. So cool. it was looking at the fact that introducing visual design and uh, principles and elements and learning about that, um, actually benefits not only the instructional designer, but the learner, you know, so the learning experience, the learner, um, knowing what to do with the visuals and how to present it really makes a difference for sure i was having a conversation um prior to this with um with someone we were talking a little bit about um storyboarding so that's kind of fresh in my mind but you you know we're often working with people who come to us with not just you know the information but they hand you a powerpoint deck and they say make this into e-learning or whatever and they're already you know emotionally attached <laughs> to the time that they spend in that powerpoint um and so it's really critical for us to be able to um, approach that PowerPoint and be able to diffuse their emotional connection by at least giving them um, fact-based strategies, uh, et cetera, you yeah. know, to, it, without hurting their ego, et cetera. But we, we do have to balance the, you know, the expectations of the people who give us something to make, like the, 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 the uh, what you just said, you know, make it pretty. Well, uh, I can make it pretty or I can make it pretty effective. Maybe uh, those aren't, you know, the exact same. <laughs> <laughs> Not that those are disparate, but what's the real, you know, what's the real goal? Are we measuring, yeah. you know, are we putting this on the wall um, or, or are we going to actually give people a test later on or, or expect them to apply this? And and what's the better thing to, to get somewhere there? Yeah. 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 Well, I don't know about you, but I would love to jump in. I've got sure. a PowerPoint yeah, yeah, yeah. presentation. Um, and, and, you know, as far as... Um, you know, presenting this kind of from that scientific place. Um, here, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Yeah, for sure. And I, I remember this is, Kev, Kevin 
had an issue. Kevin Thorne had an issue with his sharing the last time I was watching ah. one of your episodes and I was like, oh no. And he was holding up his iPad. I was like, <laughs> man, he's an expert. He went like right on the fly. Um, so yeah, so here, let me go ahead and um, start presenting. So yay. Okay, so, so oh, I, I go. Perfect. yeah, so let me know, you can see it. Um, yep. Obviously, I'm not going to be, I've got my my one slide presentation in, in front of me, so I'm not actually seeing us all um, or any of the chat. So um, so if you have questions, I'm going to lean on, um, yep, you know. Yep, I'll take care of that. Chris, yep. Awesome. Yep. Awesome. We'll keep an eye on those. All right. Well, and then give me some, some you know, you know, let me know if I'm like going <laughs> long. So just be like, Rachel. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> You know, so I wanted to kind of start off by like defining from my perspective what visual design is in, in learning experiences. And, you know, obviously this is not to be condescending. It is not to be um, like, you know, overly simplistic, but it also reminds me that, you know, visual design can be considered kind of like a, a puzzle. You know, you um, are organizing information on say a slide, um, you know, and I did see some people who are differentiating between e-learning and instructional design. There's a, a there's there is indeed uh, quite a big difference with how you are teaching online in a web-based training or even virtual learning, as if you are instructor-led. Um, all of those things, you know, take this this visual and um, and this architecture that you have to think about, but in this talk, we're just going to be talking specifically about visual design in learning experiences. That could be a motion graphic. That could be, um, you know, a PowerPoint presentation that you're delivering in, in front of a bunch of people. That could be, uh, you know, a, a presentation you're doing online or a web-based training. Mm -hmm. The key is that we're talking about kind of how choices are made on what's being displayed. You know, so you've got information that, you know, can include your header and your subtext, your body text, your call out text. Um, you know, you've got photos and, you know, graphics and illustrations, you know, all of these parts and pieces are, are what you put together in order to make your your visual experience on a slide. And I'm going to just say slide, not because that is all what we work with, um, but it, it does kind of help me say that we have this parameter or frame that we're building in, uh, that we're producing for that learning experience. So what I'd like to do and um, is kind of say, put you guys in, a, in this kind of place, right? So let's say you're this um audi you know on this mountainside obviously you've got probably rear wheel drive and you're in the middle of um you know driving through a snowstorm and there are people in your car and they're talking and you're playing music and you hit bad weather what do you think besides slowing down hopefully <laughs> you know what do you think the first thing is that you're gonna do what do you think, Chris? Like, what would you do in this situation? You've got yeah, yeah. Music. Probably just yeah. try to tone, tone down um, the noise, the noise in the space, whether that's the you know the radio. Um, yeah. Maybe yeah, you're just politely, re politely re yeah. requesting folks. Uh, hey, gang, can we? Sorry, guys, this is getting kind of critical here. Can I focus? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. what you're doing is you're eliminating as much sensory mm -hmm. input as possible so that you can white knuckle it. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm mm -hmm. sure everybody on this call has driven in bad weather before. And oh, my gosh, you know, you want to just kind of say, OK, I can't have any other input because my brain and the capacity I have in my brain has to focus on what the heck am I going to do if the car in front of me spins out, you know? Um, so, yeah. So in that kind of situation is where we kind of lead into how we process and learn new information, right? So it's, it's starting with recognizing, you know, and we have, as instructional designers, we have our work cut out for us because our senses are bombarded mm -hmm. by 
information, right? So our hearing and smell and touch and, you know, and, and sight, we're, you know, constantly surrounded by information that is, our brain is trying to interpret. And these are usually blips in time, like three seconds or less. And the brain is programmed to pay special attention to any experience that is novel or unusual. You know, and if something is unique, you know, that information passes into working memory. So, you know, working memory is the first place this new worthy information goes to be processed and it has limited capacity. You know, we can only hold about seven to nine in items for a short amount of time. So before when we had to actually memorize, you know, um, phone numbers, <laughs> <laughs> which I don't know about you guys, but I don't remember any phone numbers anymore. Um, you know, it sticks in our head for about five to 15 seconds. But what's really cool about the working memory is that it has the ability to keep information in the mind while problem solving. And so what happens is that our mind goes to our long-term memory and it goes to retrieve any similar experiences from the past that will help us determine if this new information we've just been given is useful to build on what we already know. And so long-term memory is where encoded information is stored. And encoded information are, is information that's meaningful to us, that's connected to emotion, experiences, <clears throat> it's rehearsed knowledge, and we store things that can be retrieved and pushed back into working memory. So when people are learning something new, our long-term memory allows us to, to think about what we already know, and that eases the cognitive load or the amount of work the brain does uh, in working memory while constructing that new knowledge. Because again, it has limited capacity. We only can take in so much and we can only work on so much information in the working memory. So take kind of like a, a flight simulation, like a pilot learns how to do things outside the plane hopefully, so that when they get in the plane, they've got all of these kinds of experiences and knowledge and troubleshooting, and they know what to do with it, and they can build from it. Because, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know about you guys, but I wouldn't want a pilot going like, hey, everybody, I've never been on a plane before, but hey, I'm going to fly it, you know, um, and I've never been in a simulation before either. You, you, you want something you want a pilot who's been through simulations. You want a pilot sure. who's got yeah, yeah. that experience. You know? a, a few years ago, maybe verging on seven or eight now, anyway, there mm -hmm. was something up on the International Space Station and um, and they were, uh, there was something unexpected, you know, and they were working through it. Um, and, and my Twitter feed blessed me uh, with, um, uh, with, a, with, a, with a tweet from Commander Chris Hadfield, who's a Canadian who was um, the commander for a while on the ISS, like probably previous to the group that was currently then up. And he said, basically, he said, look, this is what we do. This is what the training is all about. We may never have trained for this exact same thing, but we've trained for so many things. They now have a bank of, of stuff, uh, you know, that they can pull on as they try to troubleshoot for this specific thing that may be slightly unusual or not previously fully trained for, but basic just being, hey, we've practiced this, so they've practiced this so much, um, you know, that's what that's where all this training, you know, really kicks in. And I went, hmm, screen cap that one for sure. And I've, I'm gonna have to find that slide, uh, that find that image somewhere that I made of that screen cap, but it's exactly the same thing, yep. Yeah, it's and, and it's, you know, and it's instructional designers, you know, we wanna get that important content of our training into long-term memory so it can be used later. I mean, that's kind of one of our goals. It's like you, we're not presenting this information so that it's like, okay, well, thanks for not, you know, getting anything that you're going to remember, you know, <laughs> so, you know, and, you know, in order to do this, you know, we have to make our, our learning experiences meaningful, you know, something to connect to uh, emotionally and, and build on previous experiences and knowledge and being able to use that you're
courses have to be relevant and have just enough content to keep the working memory from kind of overworking, from overflowing. You know, <laughs> and the cool thing is, is if we are able to, to create something and rehearse it and encode it in the brain for at least 30 seconds, so basically you've convinced your learner it's important you, you're hitting your goal you're making it to learn long-term memory and you know it, and that's really kind of one of our goals so i mean what does all of this have to do with you know visual design mm -hmm. and that was one thing that during my master's program i really wanted to look into it's like okay so what does it have to do with learning and visual design and how can we create the right visuals, use the light, right visuals uh, to make sure that experience is good. Um, so, I mean, so what kinds of things, you know, and of course, Chris in the chat, whatever um, you, you see people popping in, what do you think can overload the brain during a learning experience? What kinds mm -hmm. of things do you guys think can so overload yeah. it? So folks who are, who, are, who are with us here today, type in some thoughts of things um, and I'll, I'll wait and see what the world presents here. Um, I am I am thinking actually of, of one um, one specific thing, and but um, so here, yeah, Brigitte saying noise. Uh, Yasmin is throwing in too much information. Uh, yes. Distractions, too much text, too many graphics that move, too much info. Yes. Uh, cluttered screen with too much information, irrelevant Perfect. visuals, lots of yes. noise. Oh, uh, you guys are motion, like unrelated yes. topics. These guys are pros, aren't they? They are. They are. <laughs> You're right. You're right. Not enough white space, right? Yeah. Um, split attention. Um, I, I know I, I've seen training where you've got peripheral vision, where there's motion constantly in the peripheral vision. I mean, that's why those ads pop up and they're constantly mm -hmm. moving in our peripheral vision. It really makes it hard to focus on, you know, if you're reading the content, if exactly. And did anybody mention complexity of the content? Um, no. Uh, Lots of phrasings of too much, too much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that kind of that's a common yeah. um, thing, but not not the complexity actually. Well, yeah, cluttered so, screen with too much information might even yeah, might, might that's, fit that category for exactly, sure. Exactly, sure. exactly. Yeah, and and you know, and to add to that wheelhouse because it sounds like they've all got it right. So complexity of content is one other that they, they, you guys mm -hmm. can all kind of put in your wheelhouse, and that that is in the in the sense of is this really all new material? you know, to the learner. I mean, is this brand new? Is this the first time they've ever sat, sat in a car and they're getting ready to learn how to drive? Um, they have to take in a lot more. So that is a place where you're just saying, okay, this is where you you build in chunks. You're building on top of the knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and, and your visuals actually can uh, take, uh, take some of that burden off if it's new material. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can, you know, you can utilize visuals in order to kind of ease that cognitive load if it's super complex because, and we'll talk a little bit more about it, but the number one thing that I'm hearing and you guys have got it right is what I like to call the visual distractors. Hmm. You know, we only have so much capacity in our working memory and visual distractors are very unnecessary because it's things that we have control over. Right. So an example of a visual distractor, which I, you know, I'm hearing, you know, too much and everything like that. I'm going to frame um, a principle around it. And, and the first one I wanted to, to kind of touch on is the not enough contrast part. Um, this is one that I actually um, on, on my uh, on my website and, and in my blog, and it was part of my master's program. I created a, a really short 15 minute e-learning on contrast and the power of contrast um, in, in e-learning and visual design. Um, you know, and, and if we simplify what contrast is by defining it, we're, we're looking at when one item is different from another, right? So this can be contrast between colors, between font sizes and weights and object sizes. Um, and, and what happens when we don't have enough contrast is that it, you know, 
is that it all kind of has the same you know, feeling level um, on the page, right? If there's no contrast, then it's all handled equally. Um, contrast catches the reader's eye. Like it calls out what's important. And the text, you know, in when we, when we talk about text contrast, we're talking about kind of hierarchy, which it can help you navigate content by providing you with, you know, consistent levels of size and weights. It shows the learner where to start, what's mm -hmm. next, what's to focus on. So hierarchy is also one of those things. But really, contrast is a wonderful tool to use in design to catch the reader's eye, to keep them moving forward through your, your information. Another yeah. problem, uh, visual Kim, Kim has a, okay. I, I can't resist yeah. throwing this one. Kim has a oh, comment. Please. I was at a lecture once and the instructor yeah. displayed a PowerPoint slide with wall to wall text paragraph, top oh, to boy. bottom, side to side, oh. 12 point font. No. <laughs> they uh. did not have a visual design course <laughs> because they were in the boat of content is king, right? Mm -hmm. As long as I've got the content and it's right, that's all that matters. You know, and, and exactly. And, and then know, they probably are, read it to everybody, right? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. And you're reading it and they're reading it at a different pace. There's another split attention, mm -hmm. right? Um, one thing that everybody kind of jumps in, you know, one thing that that's really important with contrast, especially right now is accessibility. Contrast mm -hmm. is incredibly important. You know, having the contrast between colors, having that contrast, um, you know, and, and tagging what's a header, what's the body, um, and really differentiating um, for accessibility. It, it's, it's a huge, a huge element in yeah. having that, that kind of learning. Yeah, and a few um, folks have mentioned, uh, brought up con uh, accessibility in the chat here too, so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and, and again, I'm pulling out kind of the things of like, so if there's no contrast, if, if you know, the wrong color is sitting on another color um, and you can't read it and you're mm -hmm. struggling, you're using working memory to struggle, to try to, to read it and figure it out. And these are things that are not necessary so that we can absorb the material that we're trying to, to, to learn from. You know, misalignments are really easy um, one that can be fixed. Meaning that, you know, because our brain loves to look for patterns. It, it, it looks for to predict what might happen next. You know, in other words, our brain likes that consistency. And if something is out of line, right, uh, you know, if, if the bullet points are, aren't in line or one slightly off, mm -hmm. our brain is triggered to say, why is that slightly off? Is there a reason? Is this something that I need to look at? Is it is it an element that matters? Um, was this intentional? So your brain goes through these questions in the subconscious going, okay, something's different. Why is it different? Mm -hmm. And it, again, it's that kind of wasted time on something that we could fix. You know? Way back at the earliest part of, uh, of my career yeah. um, in this space, um, I picked up a, a tip from someone. He, um, as part of reviewing something, he would just, run let's say it's a i don't know 50 page e-learning he would just sit and click the forward button and oh, he would watch if something moved in other words oh this header on this page is three yes. pixels over here and it's yes. but that little level of distraction is something that will pull people out of like whoa that's not and even you know pixels pixels matter in that kind of a thing that um that draw people out of the flow of, of thinking and learning and, and uh, you know squirrel squirrel so. <laughs> And, and we're looking for distractions. We are so used to distractions right now. Like, oh, my phone just dinged. Oh, I have just got a Slack message. Oh, you know, my cat needs to, you know, get down off of that before they break whatever that is, right? So we're used to these distractions. So our brain kind of is seeking them. You know, it, it, it's very interesting. Um, and so when we think about, you know, learning and, and these visual distractors and we're thinking how, you know, and everybody, jumped on, I could hear it was, you know, the lack of empty space, you know, mm. cramming stuff on a slide, you know, making sure that, oh, that the content's all there. So that's all that matters, you know, and, and it's, you know, I see a lot of people who put text in boxes, right? And there's no margin. So the bo the text is like, you can almost feel the text going, let me out, let me yeah. out. Oh my gosh, you know, the walls are, you know, coming in. Um, Empty space and white space, you know, 
it, it makes people anxious. You know, if you walk into a, a, a cluttered room or a tight space, that's the same feeling. And again, these are all, this is all in the working memory. We're not even really recognizing this, um, but we do have reactions to it. And, and it takes away from the learning, you know? So um, somebody else called out graphics and pictures that don't relate to the content. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I can't even tell you. I, I had somebody who was, who was giving me a draft of, a, of a, a learning experience and it was on sexual harassment. And there was a, I'm not kidding you, an illustration of an objectified woman uh, as the opening page. And I was like, um, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, you know, so it, 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 it it's a lot of work. Trust me, you know, I will spend hours looking for the right images because they tell stories and the wrong image can change the message and meaning of the content. And frequently people look at the image first before reading the text, because as humans, we're drawn to pictures and graphics. Especially, you know? I think, if, if there's a if there's a face in the right, we, we, oh, we, kind of, we yes. want to go straight to the eyeballs, right, because it's another person. Yes. Um, Exactly. And if you have a picture of a human and they're looking off the page, your eyes look off the page. I mean, that's like one of those really simple tools that have the human facing the text or facing the content. You want it to be important. Mm -hmm. And the eye of the learner is going to dr be drawn directly to it. You know, so, um, you know, we kind of touched on that inconsistency, you know, because our brain looks for patterns. Our brain wants to wonder why is this different? Why is this important? Should I do something with it? You know, so there's a there's a cognitive uh, or there's a, a learning theorist, um, John Sweller, and he developed the cognitive load theory. Hmm. And I love his quote, you know, since working memory has a limited capacity, instructional methods should over avoid overloading it with additional activities that don't directly contribute to learning. You know, visual distractors affect a learner's concentration. Mm -hmm. If their subconscious is spending time figuring out why something is happening visually, then they're using their working memory to do it. You know, that working memory has that limited capacity and we want them to spend time on what's important so that we can get the most amount of information to long-term memory as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. So. And one of the, yeah. you know, we, you were just talking about, you know, images and there was, um, you know, someone said uh, something along the lines in the in the chat of um, you know people sometimes just want to put in pictures to make something and here's that word again pretty pretty um, you know etc. Um, sorry, I've, I'm completely gone in my thought. Where was I going? I don't know. Well, you were so, visually distracted. Yeah, I was. I scrolled up and then <laughs> and then lost my 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 train of of thought. But sorry. Um, part so where where I was where I was going going to go. Sometimes people you know have that urge to make things look you know nicer etc. When when really the learning value is something already intrinsic. If you're going to learn something that is uh, about how to do your job better, right? You, mm -hmm. And you recognize, you know, that's the classic "what's in it for me." But if if that if that is 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 something there, then that's generating intrinsic motivation in the person to actually learn and focus. And the prettiness is actually, you know, irrelevant. We can learn from a, a decently made, you know, PDF uh, if 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 that's you know, a good tool to, you know, as opposed to a whole, um, you know, even a whole e-learning course. So sometimes the urge to make things pretty, which is something that we think is motivating or, or makes things interesting, um, you know, it, it even gets in the way of that, that intrinsic motivation of how of the, the content actually being relative, relevant to the, to the work and, and also, you know, clearly helping you do something better. So therefore you, oh, you're a salesperson, you want to learn to sell better. Boom. There's your motivation. doesn't matter how many pretty stock photos uh, uh, you might add to something. Exactly. And, you know, and, and there is balance. So like a visual distraction can actually be too much um, of a template, hmm. you know, so if, if somebody's like, well, I see the pattern, great, you know, another picture of another person doing another thing, um, you know, they're, they're going to just kind of be like, they'll tune it out. If they're surprised by something, if, it, right. if it's meaningful, if the visual actually is telling a story, if the visual is actually meaningful or interesting, and there's that keyword, it's not necessarily because it's pretty, but because it's interesting, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to pull their attention back in. So there is engagement factors with 
you know, with visuals that can take so that, you know, that, that it, it makes sure that, you know, sorry, let me go back. Um, it makes sure that we, we stay focused. That visual can pull you back into a situation if for some reason it's been going on for a while you know, it can take you to another place because again, it's going into learn, it's going into your working memory or your long-term memory and it's pulling out prior experiences. So it can help you connect to the emotion, which includes it in the brain. Mm -hmm. Visuals can help you um, to make something memorable by cueing it. You know, if you're using a cue, a visual cue to say, hey, everybody, we're coming back to this, this one icon that tells you there's a graphic ahead um, that, that's interesting, um, or we're gonna start talking when you see this icon, that visual cue, you know, once they have it in their brain what it means, then it's gonna lighten that, that cognitive load. Um, so, you know, so I think the first step is to, to really pay attention. You know, one thing that I did in, you know, in design school, when I was going through um, art school and graphic design was we critiqued each other all the time and critiquing was, you know, you, you actually have to learn how to have really thick skin as a graphic <laughs> designer because people come to you and be like, nope, don't like it. You know, yeah, everybody's and, an expert. Eh? <laughs> yeah. And, and if they're the client, you know, you can, you can try to convince them, but ultimately you're designing for them. Right. So, so you eliminate that emotional connection and you focus on the problem, right? Okay. How can I visually, you know, solve this problem? But the other thing that critiquing does is that it, it helps you spot things in design that maybe you didn't notice before. So in my opinion, the first step to becoming a better visual designer is recognizing the problems is looking at something and saying, is there enough contrast? Asking those questions of yourself, you know, heighten your awareness. Is, is, you know, that, that, that email that I just got, is there, you know, enough empty space? Is there contrast in the hierarchy? Do I know exactly what's important? Has it been broken into bullet points because it's easier for me to digest? Um, did they add an image so that I would remember something um, a little bit more? Um, because it told a story, you know, so, so my first thing that I like to tell people is, Hey, just heighten your awareness. Say this week, I'm going to put a sticky note on my monitor and I'm going to say every kind of type of communication that's trying to vie for my attention. I'm going to look at what's the contrast like, you know, what does the contrast look like? And, and it's like that new car, you know, like I really want to have this car and I want it to be a green car. And then all of a sudden everything is a green car out there. You're like, <laughs> I had no idea there were so many green cars, you know, so um, heightening your awareness really gets to the point where then all of a sudden you see it in your own work. Mm -hmm. If you can start seeing it in other people's work, it makes it easier to see it in yours, you know, so that's like the, one of the first things. And in fact, I do have a, um, a handout and somebody was, was mentioning some really good graphic design books and some visual design books in the chat window. And I have a, a handout on my website that at the end, I'll give you that, um, cool. uh, <clears throat> that, that has kind of some of my favorite books, um, nice. and, and, and kind of like a, okay, this week, this is what I want you to focus on. And, and it's kind of that reminder of, okay, I'm heightening my awareness on maybe one principle or one design element this week. Um, so if we have time, and I don't think we do, we have four minutes. Um, yeah, we've got five or seven, five or okay, seven in that five room, to so, seven yeah. minutes. I will <laughs> probably be able to kind of work it together, but I figured we could kind of take this kind of slide, you know, which is over the top bad, right? Yeah, there's a reason I made it over the top bad. But um, here's here's where you can kind of look at it. And I can guarantee the information on this slide is absolutely important and relevant. So in the chat window, what are a few things that you would change on this slide to help it out? <laughs> You're getting uh, um, some visceral reactions already in the chat. Like, Sarah oh says, "Hard." <laughs> Peter says, "No," with plenty of O's. Uh, <laughs> oh, and, and 
Carrie has announced everything in all caps and answers in answer to your question of what's wrong. So, ouch, whoa. Everything. <laughs> oh, some, there are some things here. Uh, change okay. the background texture. Make the important information yeah. bigger. Um, yeah. Kevin's noting background. Uh, yellow and white title is being called out. Um, organize the text better, more consistently. Different size text boxes. No alignment. Use bullets. Why the horse, though? <laughs> That's going to become my line for today. Why the horse, though? <laughs> Why the horse? Well, what's the title? <laughs> Important safety tips around horses. <laughs> so, so again, exactly. You guys are picking up on everything. And if you want, um, it's only a minute long, but... I can show you kind of a little bit of, and I don't think you'll hear the music in the background, but here is what it looks like when I videoed myself kind of shifting and changing and taking into effect, into account, you know, do you actually hear the music? Not, I'm not hearing it, no. Okay, just making sure, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so. What I did was I actually videoed myself making this. And of course, I had had kind of the parts and pieces of how I wanted it to look um, on the side so I could pull it over really quickly. But you can see a couple of things that I've done is, you know, I've, I've brought in alignment. You know, I have um, made th this hierarchy change of, of information with my font. I've used a very important color, which, you know, we all have on our stop signs, red you know, that says, hey, you know, I've bolded one, be careful, you know, and I'm pointing to the arrow, arrow to the horse, be careful around horses, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, you know, you can, you can see that how things are spaced and all of a sudden now you're getting this information in a way that makes a lot more sense. Um, you're able to, to remember it better. There's more white space. Um, so it's taken that this information here and it's really kind of cleaned it up so um and i'm a big person believer in easing in uh content so you can see i've i've you know taken that into account when i when i show content i like to just kind of ease it in so that people aren't having that cognitive load um expanded so so yeah, so I can't believe I kind of clicked through it and 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 got through it and mm -hmm. and opened up some some time for questions if anybody has any. And if I can, yeah. I can um minimize my this part since it's not moving. Yeah. And go back um, to you. I have to throw in this when you were asking if we could hear the the, the, the sound from the video. Um, Jennifer threw in. I'm hearing Glenn Campbell singing "Rhinestone Cowboy." Oh. <laughs> that's that's a that's a different kind of distraction in the learning process. Uh, I, we don't have a cure for that. Um, it, it's just there. It's gonna. It's never going to go away, right? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna throw something into the chat here, I, and I know you've got your resources that you'll you'll send in, and this might be included. But this has been. Um, Dr. Ruth Colvin Clark's um, e-learning in the science of instruction. Yes. I, I, I was fortunate to stumble on it somehow way, way back. It's been through like four different editions. I think I have editions two and four, both of them um, in my, um, in my, on my library shelves. Um, and one of the things that I really valued about that book um, was the, um, not only just telling you, first of all, it's all research based, right? So that's yep. important, not uh, trying to eliminate assumptions. And there were so many things, even, you know, in the projects that I was working on that I'm looking at it going, yeah, okay, I'm going to stop doing that. But what was really a, a valuable for me in that, in the presentation, that information was it framed it also somewhat in the way of being able to actually then discuss this with your SMEs or your stakeholders, you know, yeah. why we shouldn't do this, which is always the challenge that we've got. We might know something is better, but you've got you know, the expectation, the vision that other people have in their mind of, of this. And um, um, I mean, one of the things that, um, there's several things that have always stuck with me. One of them was, um, you know, extraneous non, non-related information. And I went, oh, okay, because yeah. I just finished a project which was scenario-based interviewing clients, but the client had wanted um, a corporate trivia. Uh, every once in a while, you'd get given a question and you could earn 
points and they weren't related to you know the subject it was just like history oh. of the company and that kind of a thing um and i went <laughs> okay if i ever get a chance to rewrite that that sucker's getting you know yanked out and i got a chance a year and a half later to go back to it um because the client wanted some changes and i threw some things into the mix and i said also can we get rid of that because that's you know here's and they went yeah let's get rid of it people didn't like that anyway and i went cool so yeah <clears throat> no, it's it 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 is that extrinsic. It is the the distractions. It is, mm -hmm. you know, what is actually necessary. What is benefiting? Making those intentional um, choices. I know I had one person who asked the question about what is the message about red um, in in the background and why are you using it? Um, that's a great question. Um, red is a very powerful tool, um, and it's a very powerful color. Uh, we use it, you know. We have red for our ambulance. We have red for flashing lights. We have red, um, you know, in our stop sign. It draws our attention quickly because it's such a, um, a an energetic and vibrant color. It's a hot color, a warm color, and so when you use it, you're really triggering people to say, "This is something to pay attention to," right? Mm -hmm. You you wouldn't make your you know your stop sign a pretty pastel you know green or or yellow you're making it red you're like hey pay attention so when you do use it in small amounts um you know you're really drawing attention in fact it is something that that artists did um you know centuries ago when they were doing paintings they would actually drop in little bits of red around the painting because your eye would automatically travel to the most vibrant color and, and moment and they actually are training you to look in a circle mm -hmm. to see the full painting right it's very intentionally used um so red is is a powerful tool when you're using mm -hmm. and trying to capture someone's attention um and, and like most things that uh, you just got to use it judiciously Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's that balance. So visual design is a lot about balance. It's about balancing how much you have on a slide, how much you're easing in. And the balance is all tied to that science behind things, right? Yeah, it's that sure. science of how much information can we take in at one time? We got to really make it useful. So. For sure. Well, we have bumped up against uh, the balancing act of time here. We're <laughs> coming to the conclusion of our time. Um, Rachel, toss in your uh, contact info oh, in the yeah. chat in case people want to find that. Um, as always, thank you so much. Uh, great, another great, fascinating conversation. So many things that that we could we, we we clearly need you to come back and and do part two of this and develop this uh, some of this info uh, further for us because uh, uh, so much more to talk about around this uh, around this whole topic here. And thank you everyone for such great questions. And if if there's any of those, you know, feel free to, to reach out um, here. I'll, I'll even put my email in here. Um, awesome. And uh, as always, gang, thanks for everything. Thanks for thank the great you, conversation. Thank you and thanks for inviting chat. me. Rachel, thanks so much for uh, uh, coming and we'll see you again soon, I'm sure. Would love it. Awesome. Thank you so thanks, much. Gang.